Well, praise the Lord, everybody. I want to thank you so much for tuning in to our midweek service. God has been good to us. He's blessed us, and he has kept us, and we're so grateful for all of his goodness, mercy, and kindness towards us. So we just give God all the honor and all the praise for all that he is doing. So we're just thankful for that. Going to go into prayer. Going to get right into our midweek service. I don't know. I'm trying to think if I did everything right. I think I forgot to put the. Well, God has a way of working things out. So, Father, we thank you for this day, for life, health, and strength, all the many blessings you've given to us. As always, I pray that you'd allow me to put myself aside, that your spirit might be manifest, that you might have your own way. Knowing our ears to hear your word and our hearts to receive it. Thank you for all of my brothers and my sisters, that you bless them with all that they stand in need of. All of you, none of me, pray that you continue to stand up in me to preach and teach your word, and that you be glorified and be magnified in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you for tuning in to the midweek service of Faith Bible Church. I want to welcome you. Thank God for my wife and kids and church family online, my family. All the saints of God, God has been good to us, and we're so grateful for all that he is doing for us. want to just put out a couple of reminders from um, Sunday, like we told you, on March 20th. That is a Wednesday night, not next Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, the 20th, on March 20th. We're going to do a home buyers seminar on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. So um, you're welcome to attend in person. It is an in-person home buyer. So I will not be um, on the 20th doing regular midweek service. We're going to actually do a home buyer seminar. For those of you that are interested in home buying, credit repair, all of that kind of stuff, we're going to take that Wednesday night to do that here at the church in person for all of you all that can make it. And that will be uh, hosted by Orange Realty Masters and... Um, Andre Williams Development. So that will be March 20th. The Buddies bus will be here on April 13th. April 13th. And you can still register for the Buddy bus and um, get your uh, mammograms done here. That's with Baptist. And we'll be having a health fair on that day, April 13th. So you can still do all of that. So God is good. And I just need to make one adjustment. And then we're going to jump right into our Bible study. We'll be in the book of Hebrews. We're going to be, we're going to start in the book of Hebrews, just two books, Hebrews and Philippians is where we're going to be at. So um, we want you to tune in and grab your Bible so you can follow along with that also. So amen. Amen. So if you remember on Sunday, if you remember on Sunday, I want to back up the Sunday and um, and this might be a little I'm gonna come at you tonight, maybe a little different because we're talking about the kingdom and we're talking about that also comes with responsibility. And um, we want to back up to Sunday. And so the question began, the question began that I put out there was. What if our words were seeds and all of our words like seeds took root and grew and produced fruit? What kind of garden would we have? If all of our words were seeds, what kind of garden would we have? What would grow up from the seeds? And um, then in reality, the truth is that um, our words are like seeds. Our words are like seeds, not what if they were, but they actually are. And if you remember Jesus in the parable of the sower, when he gives the explanation of the parable, he says the kingdom of heaven is like a seed. The seed is the word. The word is a seed. Power, life, and death are in the tongue. It's in the word. Our words are like seeds. And this is not. This is not that we can just go and say what we want and have it magically appear. We're not at that level of power. 
the Almighty God is at that level of power where he can speak and things happen out of nothing. But, but we are not Almighty. So we can't just say something out of the lust and desires of our own selfish will or our own imagination and expect it to happen. Our words must be, they, they got to be almost like an echo, a repeat of what we heard God say. Yeah, our words should be a repeat of what we heard God say. Noah said it was going to rain. He said that because he heard God say it was going to rain. Abraham said he was leaving his country and his kinsmen and going to another place. Why would Abraham say that? Because he heard God say it. Moses told Pharaoh what Moses heard God say. Let my people go. Joshua told the leaders and the elders of Israel when they was confronting Jericho, he told them what he heard God say. His words were in line with what he heard from God. So the men and women of God were not just randomly speaking from their own imaginations or their own ideas. They were speaking from what they heard God say. The prophets, Jeremiah, Elijah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Michael, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Nathan, they all said what they heard God say. Nobody just spoke after their own imagination or their own thoughts. Gabriel told Zacharias and Mary, Gabriel, an angel, what did he say? He told them what God said. You remember Moses was on a ship, not Moses, um, Paul was on a ship, and the men were afraid because there was going to be shipwrecked. And what did Paul do? Paul told them, don't worry, not one life will be lost. Why did he say that? Because he heard God say it. So our speaking and what we say and the power of life and death being in what you say is not simply being able to say what you want. It must be based upon what the Lord said. And death is death because it separates from God. So death is separation from God. And when your words are separate from God's word, how can you, what you say be anything but death? It's not what God said. If what you're saying is separate from what God said, how can it be anything but death? It's separate from what God say. Let me. God never said you couldn't make it. God never said that. If you say that, then what you say is separate from what God said. God never said that nobody loves you, nobody cares about you. That you all by yourself and you ain't got nobody. God never said that. But if you say that, then again, you're saying something separate from what God said. And how could that be anything but death? Anything separate from God is death. God never said he was a respecter of persons. If you say that he is, then what you're saying is separate from what he is saying. God never said, that's just the way things are and things ain't never going to get no better and, 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 and that, that's just the way it is. God never said that. He don't even talk like that. But again, if that is how you talk and if that is what you say, then you are speaking separate from what God say. If you notice, when it comes to the saints of God, God's words are always positive. When it comes to what God has to say about the believers in Christ, when you look at it, 
Look at what God has to say about the believers in Christ. Everything is always in the direction of victory, blessings, and favor. Every time God speaks concerning the believers in Christ, the direction is always towards blessings and favor, victory, overcoming power. Always. Well, if God's words to believers are always victorious, blessings, and favor, then why do we encounter so many negative, woe is me, pity party believers? Why do we have so many believers saying things that are separate from what God said? Now, the short answer, I can give you the short answer like we always do because we blame everything on the devil. The broad general answer is the devil is busy. Satan is doing what he does. Spiritual warfare is real. And in spite of the believers believing in God, Satan has still managed to convince them that they are not victorious, that they are not blessed, that they are not favored, and their talk reflects it. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And the enemy has filled their hearts with so many problems and so many issues and so many complaints and so many murmuring and so much disappointment. So whenever they speak, that's all that comes out. That's the easy answer. The devil did it. The devil planned it. The devil set it up. The devil did it. The devil made me do it. Just blame the devil. But how can a defeated foe, which Satan is, be so successful against a believer in Christ. If God is all powerful and we believe in him, he can move mountains. How is it that Satan, who was defeated on Calvary, still managed to keep the believer in bondage? And this is just one reason I won't, I'm sure there are many, but this is just the one I want to hit tonight. This is one of the reasons why he's so successful. Believers don't always mature. They stay babies, immature. They don't grow up. Now, that's going to be kind of heavy for somebody because we want to hear the Lord going to bless us, the Lord going to bring us out, all that. But, but really, in reality, in real spiritual warfare, believers don't always grow up. And the sad reality of walking with God is everybody around you is not going to grow up. Now, babies, children, they say things that very few people pay attention to because they're children. Most of what children say, most of what children say is based on what? Their, their personal emotions and their selfish ambitions, their selfish desire, what they want. That's mostly what they talk about. They talk how they feel about what they want. When they can't have their way or they can't get what they want or you won't do what they say, because they are children, their emotions dictate their words. But as they mature and grow up, children are supposed to learn how to be more responsible with their words so that not any and everything comes out of their mouth. Children can pout and say, I don't like you. They can do that. They're children when they don't have their weight. And the response from the adult will be something like, you'll get over it. Better straighten up your face, go somewhere and sit down. You'll be fine because they will be. They're children and we know they will be. But, but when a 30-year-old and a 40-year-old and a 50-year-old pout when they don't have their way and people won't do what they say and say stuff like out their mouth, I don't like you, and say whatever else they want to say out their mouth, then, then we got a problem. We take a different response. Now they want to know what's wrong with you. Why is all this coming out your mouth every time you don't have your way? 
Why do you feel like you can just say what you want to say when things don't go your way? Why do you feel like you can just open your mouth and just say whatever you feel like whenever you feel like it? It's because you are immature. This is how you can say you believe God, but talk defeat. This is how you can say at one side of your mouth that I'm saved, born again, baptized, Holy Ghost filled. And after the other side of your mouth, oh, it's so hard. And oh, I'm just a motherless child and everything going so wrong. You can tell, yeah, and I ain't, trying to, I ain't trying to spare nobody feeling so. So we in spiritual warfare, this, this is too serious to try to spare your feelings. So, I mean, if you got to flip the channel, just go ahead and flip the channel. And you can tell the maturity level of a believer based upon the conversation. What they say, the words that come out of their mouth. You're a believer in the greatest king to ever exist. He is not Alpha or Omega. He is Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He's your Father. He is Almighty. And you are a believer in Him, and your conversation has nothing victorious about it. Something is wrong with your maturity. How old are you? How mature are you? When you look through the Bible and you find the word complete in the Bible, it means mature. It refers to being spiritually grown up. It also means whole in Christ Jesus. It, and, and we all know that a person's chronological age 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, don't always match their maturity. Many of us, many of us know grown adults who are still very childlike. They're childlike in their attitude, they're childlike in their character, and they're childlike in their words. Now, if a baby don't stay the same weight and the same size they were when they were born, and we know they don't because they grow up, the baby turns into, what, well, an infant, the infant turns into a, a toddler, then the toddler grows into an adolescent, the adolescent grows into a teenager, and the teenager grows into adults. You and I, as saints of God, believers in Christ, were not to stay at the same spiritual level that we were in when we first got saved. You're not supposed to be on the same level you was on when you first got saved spiritually. Maturity is the process of growing deeper spiritually and becoming more like Christ in your character, more like Christ in your conduct, more like Christ in your attitude, more like Christ in your actions, and more like Christ in your words. Maturity don't just happen because a person accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. No, you're not just going to automatically mature because you got saved. You're not just going to automatically mature because you joined the church. You're not going to automatically mature because you're born again. And when you really think about it, and when we look at it, and we're going to look at it right now, Spiritual maturity is not, it's kind of rare <laughs> if we really looked at it in the body of Christ. It don't happen as often as many of us think that it does. When we look back on Paul's teaching, and we finna go to Hebrews, and we're going to go to to Hebrews in a minute, but, but if you look back on Paul's in 1 Corinthians, 2 and 3, 1 Corinthians 2 and 3, Paul is frustrated over the lack of growth to the point that he has to keep on correcting them over their maturity. It's in the Bible. So 
immaturity in the body of Christ is not something that just started happening. This thing's been going on for a long time. Paul is frustrated that you won't grow up. You will not mature. You ought to be beyond this now. This is why you got so much strife. This is why you got so much trouble. This is why you got so much heartache. You're babes. You won't grow up. The right of Hebrews. We're going to go to Hebrews. The right of Hebrews had the same issue with believers. That they needed to grow up. How is it that believers in the Lord God Almighty, who has all power in his hand, yet their words are so defeated and so void of victory. Not all of them, but some of them. How is it? It is because some have matured and some have not. How old are you? How mature are you? Look at your words. Look at your actions. Look at your attitude. How mature are you? Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5, verse 11 says this. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you, you're dull of hearing. In other words, he's saying, it's hard for me to tell you this because I already know. I already know your maturity level, well, how childish you are, you are not going to respond to this very well. Verse 12, Hebrews 5 and 12, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong drink. You have become like, I got to minister to you, not like a mature person, but like a baby. And, and, and I got to do this at a time that you should have been a teacher. But here you are, somebody got to tell you to straighten up your face, fix your attitude, forgive, let that go, put a smile on your face, rejoice in the Lord. You should be teaching this, but somebody's got to teach you. You. You should be off milk, but you're not. Verse 13. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are full of age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Milk Christians. This is why the enemy has been so successful at robbing and defeating and keeping believers in God of God in bondage. They won't grow up. They're milk Christians. They're not mature. They're not all in. They're milk Christians. Milk Christians who should have been eating meat by this time, but they refuse to grow up. Milk Christians are believers who have not developed the habit of going to the word of God for answers to the issues of life. That is not their habit. They don't go to the word of God for issues of life. Milk Christians are not accustomed to, to answering and addressing life realities from God's perspective. They say what they want to say. They don't answer from God's perspective. They get their direction from their emotions. Milk Christians get their directions from their friends. Milk Christians get their directions from family, their culture, their ethnicity. Milk Christians get their answer from, from social media. 
They 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 go to social media for they uh, they post all their business on social media for somebody to tell them what to do, or anything else that will feed them quickly and easily. That's what milk Christians do. Milk Christians, because they're babes, they then they refuse to grow up. It's not that they can't grow up; they don't want the responsibility of growing up. They can hear fifty-two sermons a year. They can have 365 daily devotionals. They can participate in midweek service and still never experience victory in their lives through personal growth because they are milk Christians. A milk Christian is a defeated Christian that names the name of Christ but refuses to grow up. And that makes them unable to teach others. Why? Because they themselves are babes. How can you teach what you don't live? How can you teach what you don't practice? How can you teach what you don't engage in? You don't go to the Word of God for answer. You make posts on social media for answer. You don't go to the Word of God for direction in life. No, you call your buddies and your friends. You're still dependent upon the world and you have not grown up and become accustomed to relying and dependent upon the word of God. You're a milk Christian. On the other hand, meat Christians Meet saints, their words are different. Their actions are different. Their conduct is different. Meet saints have discovered, according to the scripture, the skill of spiritual discernment. Meet Christians know how to make right decisions based on what they heard God say rather than what they heard from the world. They make decisions based upon what they heard God say rather than what they heard friends and family say. Their decisions are based upon what they heard God say rather than what they saw on the talk show, rather than the fast that is going on. Meek Christians are not looking for entertainment or quick fixes. Meek Christians ain't looking for no easy way out. Meek Christians through patience and endurance and, and prayer and fasting have learned to bridle their tongue and say only what they heard the Lord say. And even after hearing what the Lord say, the meat Christian still won't say it until God gives them permission to say what they heard the Lord say. That's a mature, a complete, a whole, a, a meat Christian. Meat Christians ain't trying to live out their walk with God through temper tantrums and, and, and ups and downs and, and attitudes and, and fads and, and, and popularity. Meek Christians ain't trying to throw no fit every time things don't go their way. Meek Christians know how to remember what the Lord say and to fix their face and to fix their praise and to fix their worship. In spite of what's going on around them, they don't say what they feel. They say what they heard the Lord say. They don't say what's raging on the inside of them. You can get on a meek Christian last nerve, but before they speak, they check themselves and make sure that they only say what they heard the Lord say. Meek Christians understand that it's a process. That's a meek Christian. They understand that I have not already attained. Either were perfect. But meek Christians understand I'm following after something. That's from Philippians, the third chapter. I'm following after that I may apprehend that also that I'm apprehended of in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3 and 13 says this, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting these things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. My goal is to be like Christ. 
meet Christian. My goal is not politics. My goal is not to be a good politician. I ain't trying to be no good Democrat or no good Republican or no good independent. That is not my goal. I, my goal is not my race and culture. I ain't trying to be no good Southerner. That ain't my goal. My goal is not my gender. I ain't got nothing to prove to masculinity. My goal is not my nationality. I am who I am. My goal is to be Christ-like to be holy in all of my ways. And if I am going to be complete in him, if I'm going to be whole in him, then I got to be mature. And mature folks just don't say any and everything out their mouth. So why do we have so many believers and such a powerful God that can do anything and move mountains. But those who believe in him, why is it that some of them speak so defeated and so cast down and so persecuted? It is because they are milk Christians. One of the reasons is we won't grow up. And don't think that maturity is something that is automatic. No, it's not something that's automatic. It is for those who have committed themselves. It's for those who have dedicated themselves to exercise, discern both good and evil, use their senses to act on what they heard God say, to speak on what they heard God say, to be motivated by what they heard God say. So everybody don't automatically mature. And which, logically speaking, which is easier to defeat? A babe or a full-grown adult? Which is easier to manipulate? A babe or a full-grown adult? Which is easier to talk out of their blessings and out of their favor? A babe or a full-grown adult? Which is easier to steal from? A babe or a full-grown adult? So sometimes, sometimes, the difference between victory and defeat is maturity. A babe or full grown adult mature in Christ? Milk or meat? It ain't rocket science. Father, we thank you. We pray, Father God, that you would shake the complacency of the body of Christ. That we will all grow up into the full knowledge of Jesus Christ. That you would fill us with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that we will be no more babes stuck on milk, but that we will all mature to handle the meat of your word. That our actions, 
our attitudes, our thoughts, and our words will be governed by your words. And that we will seek you in all of our ways. That we will acknowledge you in everything so that you can direct our path. You are a victorious God. You're a great God. You're a wonderful Savior. And your people are victorious. And we thank you for all that you have done, for all that you are doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're not saved, pray this prayer with me. You can give your life to the Lord right now, wherever you are. Father God, in the name of Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and be my God. I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I believe that he was raised from the dead. And I accept my gift of salvation. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We believe in what God said. We say what we heard him say. And if you prayed that prayer and you weren't saved and you gave your life to the Lord, hallelujah, thank God for you because now you are saved. Man, find a good church home, stay in his word, walk with God, and have a blessed evening in the Lord. God bless you all and God keep you.